And for more on this and today's trade, we're joined by Julia Lee from Bell Direct. Julia, we want your take on this announcement from Fortescue because it still does leave a lot of questions surrounding economies of scale, capital preservation, cash flow, lots of questions still up in the air. And also why Fortescue's management was painting such a bright picture recently when it probably knew this was in the pipeline. Okay, the cash is king at the moment and in an environment where we are seeing falling prices and rising costs, what we are seeing is preservation of capital by our big miners. We've already seen BHP Billiton deferring Olympic Dam. We've also seen Sundance Resources accepting a lower offer, a takeover offer uh, coming through for uh, its assets as well. So if we have a look at Fortescue, it is a lot all about iron ore prices and in the month of August we saw iron ore prices tumbling from 111 US a tonne down to just 82 US a tonne. So in this type of environment I guess uh, the theory is that the higher marginal producers of iron ore will be cut out of the market and most of those exist in China but really we haven't seen much of an impact in terms of supply so far. So today we've heard from Fortescue that it would be looking at the deferring of projects, it would be also looking at cost cutting as well as cutting jobs. It's slashed its capital expenditure for the year from $6.2 billion down to just $4.6 billion. And of course, with some of its projects now being deferred, we are expecting to see a lower uh, production result for the year than initially forecast as well. So a lot of it has to do with the iron ore price and whether this is just a seasonal weakness and we will see a bounce back in the fourth quarter of the year or whether iron ore prices are going to uh, persist in, term, in, in terms of weakness for a lot longer. Um, and I guess if we see an iron ore price bounce back in the fourth quarter, it will be if we do see more supply being taken off the market and we're slowly starting to see signs of those capital expenditure plans being uh, paired back by those mining companies. Julia, your take on trade today, we're down around four tenths of a percent, not necessarily flowing, uh, following Shanghai lower either because it's still fairly flat at this stage. I just want to get your take on why we're seeing these losses today. It seems like the, the banks are the major point of weakness. If we have a look at the intraday graph of the Australian market, you can see that we have been heading lower, but it is on extremely light volume, so more than halfway through the trading day, and there's less than $2 billion worth of stock which has gone through the market. Now, part of that is that we did see the U.S. markets on holiday yesterday for a Labor Day holiday, and I guess the market's really just treading water ahead of the two key risk events this week, and that's the European Central Bank meeting on Thursday, as well as the U.S. job numbers out on Friday. Here domestically, we've seen our current account deficit numbers which came in narrower than expected at $11.8 billion versus an expectation of $12.3 billion for the June quarter. As you can see there hasn't been much of an impact in terms of the Australian market but we have seen an impact in terms of the Aussie dollar and if we have a look at the Aussie dollar we've seen a climb since those numbers were released. So it does look like net exports will contribute to GDP of about a positive 0.3 percent uh, based on those numbers. In terms of the Australian share market though the biggest move seemed to be those stocks which are trading ex-dividend. We are seeing Acrux down by 4.5%, that's trading ex-dividend. But at long year down by 8.3%, that stock's trading ex-dividend as well. And CSG Group, CSV is the code there, down a massive 34%, and that's really because it's returning 20 cents uh, worth of dividends to shareholders after a sale of its assets that it had. So not a lot happening in terms of the market, but as you mentioned, Kate, the bank's showing weakness. We are seeing some strength in the material sector, and no doubt uh, the talk of potential stimulus coming through from China as well as the U.S. helping those commodity plays. So BHP, Rio Tinto, higher. And I guess tonight in the U.S. we'll be watching the manufacturing numbers come coming out, the ISM manufacturing numbers, given that we're seeing pretty weak uh, re reads around the rest of the globe. So we've seen some weak numbers coming through from China as well as from Europe overnight. But altogether, some weakness in the Australian market, but on extremely light volume, so really just treading water there. Absolutely. Julia, do you think we'll get a bit of a bump up should the Reserve Bank reference China and the slowdown there? That's what we seem to be hearing from some analysts this morning. I guess in terms of the interest rate decision at 2.30, um, the market's expecting to see rates on hold at 3.5%. But as you mentioned, the key is the rhetoric over China, expecting to see an adjustment in terms of the outlook for China. We've seen a tumble in commodity prices now, and it does look like demand is softening out of China. And indeed, if we continue to see that softening without any sort of stimulus or interest rate cuts through from China, that's really going to increase the case for cutting of interest rates here in Australia. Already here in Australia, we've seen recent 
recent uh, economic data looking quite soft. Yesterday we saw uh, retail sales numbers which were much lower than expected. So signs that the domestic economy may be slowing as well. So all up, the market expecting to see rates on hold, but the commentary is going to be important there, especially the commentary around China. Absolutely. Also, Goodman Field are looking to close factories to boost growth. This is a story we're growing very familiar with in the manufacturing space, isn't it, Julia? I guess Goodman Fielder has been hit with a, a number of potential issues over the past couple of years which has meant a very difficult uh, operating environment and one of those has been the high commodity costs. If we have a look at a loaf of bread about 30% of the cost of that is raw material costs and of course we've seen uh, soft commodities rising but not only that we've seen the supermarket wars and the, the, the battle for uh, an increase in terms of the private labels by the supermarkets really impacting on a food manufacturer like Goodman Fielder. So it does look like some changes in store for Goodman Field. It, would, it will be looking at closing at least 10 of its factories and this is in an effort to try and spur on growth and try and spur on uh, returns as well. It's looking at trying to improve its return on capital employed from 11.6% uh, in 2012 to 13 to 15 percent by 2015. It sees a sustainable earnings per share growth rate of around about 6 percent. So really we're looking at Goodman Field also concentrating on cutting costs uh, and cutting out some of those underperforming assets as well in order to try and spur on its business. Its shares are down by one and a half percent and over the last 52 weeks we've seen the shares under pressure down by 20 percent. One thing that could turn around the company's stock price performance though is some corporate activity. We know that Wilma has a significant stake in Goodman Fielder and it has been the topic of potential uh, takeover uh, takeover activity but for the time being it looks like it's trying to uh, address some of the challenges in its underlying business and cutting costs and cutting underperforming assets looks like a first step.